So this evening's talk is called Fire and Water. And fire and water are two symbols of the Holy Spirit that also correspond to two of the sacraments. They, they correspond to baptism and confirmation. We're going to look at these this evening, but I want to focus first on the Holy Spirit and what he does or what he can do in our lives. My hope is that this will then shed greater light on the power of these two great sacraments and their fundamental role in the Christian life. For the most part, my experience in talking with uh, other Catholics and working in faith formation, a lot of people live as if the Holy Spirit didn't exist. We don't speak to him. We don't pray to him. We don't really think about him. Usually in confirmation class, obviously, he's the, he's the topic of the class. So we learn a little bit then, but, but then he kind of gets put back under the bed, so to speak, until Pentecost rolls around each year. So why are we ignoring him? Why don't we talk about him? Why don't we, why don't we unleash his power in our lives? Part of our reluctance, our missing the boat, or you could even say an obstacle, I think, on this, on this is that we really don't know what the scriptures and the, and the church teach about the Holy Spirit. So is he a dove? Is he this gust of wind? Is he a cloud? Well, all of these images tell us something about the Holy Spirit, but they're images first and foremost. So they don't tell us everything. They don't exhaust the mystery. In other words, they just hint at it. So that means that we have to read and study and pray if we want our friendship with the Holy Spirit to bear fruit in our lives. The second obstacle is that we're afraid sometimes, or you could even say just uncomfortable with calling upon the Holy Spirit. A lot of Catholics that I've talked to, at least in the United States, see this as a Protestant thing, that we Catholics don't talk or pray to the Holy Spirit in the same way. Well, why, I wonder, when the Holy Spirit is the finger and the power of God, would we excise his role in our personal life simply because we're afraid of what people will think? We're talking about God. This is the third person of the most blessed Trinity. And I, I'm going to hesitate to bring him into my life because I'm afraid of what other people will think. I mean, if that's our attitude, well, he surely will not come because he's not welcome. But on the flip side of that, if we set aside some of those fears and we begin to invite the Holy Spirit in on a daily basis and ask him to manifest himself, he will do it. He will come. So when we invite him in, what exactly are we asking him to do? In other words, what's the work of the Holy Spirit? His primary work, you could say what he's about most of all, is our sanctification. And that means making Jesus Christ live within us, which means our transformation through grace. This is also called our divinization. He will make you, in other words, more and more like God. This means that he brings out what's best in you and he purges you of everything that smacks of egoism, sin, and death. He brings out your purity. He brings out your beautiful femininity and your awesome masculinity. He will make us more and more disciples of Jesus friends, and members of God's own family. That's what the invitation to the Holy Spirit entails for each and every one of us, that transformation. Now, all of this is possible for us, but not without our consent and cooperation. Every morning, therefore, when you wake up and you kneel beside your bed and you say your morning prayers, you can ask the Holy Spirit to come and to guide you through the day. And he will come in his presence will change your life. So let's now look at the first symbol of the Holy Spirit, water. Water signifies the action of the Holy Spirit in the sacrament of baptism. Why? Well, first of all, there's, there is the reality of a new birth. So a regeneration, a being born again in, in Jesus Christ. So just like our first birth took place in water, so our second birth takes place in water. However, in baptism, the water is not limited to its natural capacity. What I mean by that is it does more than ordinary water 
because of the presence of the Holy Spirit and the work of the sacrament. So in his preaching, John the Baptist really emphasized this. Um, he said, I have baptized you with water, but he, meaning Jesus, the one who comes after John, will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So our baptism takes place in the Holy Spirit, and the material symbol or element of that is water. But there is more to this water symbolism than that. And this is really interesting. In the first letter to the Corinthians, chapter 12, verse 13, St. Paul says that we are to drink of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Here's the line. He says, for by one spirit, we are all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. So what does he mean? How can we drink the Holy Spirit? I was looking for an answer for this. I, I kept, I was reading the catechism and reading scripture, and I discovered something amazing. First, in the gospel according to John, we have a couple of really intriguing references to the water that comes from Jesus and that flows into us. The first one comes from the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman, which happens in chapter four. Jesus says to her, everyone who drinks of this water, meaning the water that they are sitting next to, they're at the well of Jacob. And so he's referring to the water in the well. Everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. The water that I shall give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So that's John 4. Now listen to this from John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and proclaimed, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. That's the quote from Jesus. And then John, as the narrator, gives us an explanation. He says this, now this he said about the spirit, which those who believed in him were to receive. So if you connect the dots between these two scenes, what our Lord is teaching us is that the water that he gives is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is also living water. And that means that it gives us something. Another way of saying that is that the living water becomes a source within us. A source of what? A source welling up to eternal life. So let's think about this concept of eternal life a little bit. Think about what you long for. If you go to the deepest part of you, you long for the things that will last. You long, like the Samaritan woman who was speaking with Jesus, not to have to draw water over and over again. You want to be complete. You want to be satisfied. You want to be at peace and at rest with God and with others, enjoying a true communion of life and love where you are known and loved for who you are and you know and love others for who they are. Our life now lived with the Holy Spirit can begin this process of eternal life within us. That's what the living water does. It is water that gives you something. It gives you life. This is beautifully summarized in a line from the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17 from the book of Revelation. Let him who hears say, come, and let him who is thirsty come. Let him who desires take the water of life without price. So to start all this, we have to drink from Christ. How do we do that? The answer again is hidden in that reference from John chapter seven, verse 38. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart shall flow rivers of living water. So how do you drink from Christ? Believe. The answer is believe in him. So believe that Jesus is the son of God. Believe in what he taught his apostles and what his apostles handed on 
to us and then live that every day. The Catechism expounds upon this idea and actually gives us four wellsprings where we can drink from Christ and drink the water that is the Holy Spirit. You can find these in paragraphs 25, 2652 to 2660 in the Catechism. This is absolutely amazing stuff. This is incredible. So the first wellspring that the Catechism mentions is the Word of God. So reading scripture, I know, can be intimidating for a lot of people. But I just found this podcast called The Bible in a Year with Father Mike Schmitz. So in this podcast, Father Mike reads a portion of scripture, which is then explained and a little, not a lot, it's not like a homily, it's, it's just a little explanation to make sure that we understand what's been proclaimed. It takes about 20 minutes a day and by listening to the podcast, you actually get through the whole Bible in a year. You can also listen to it anywhere and at any time because it's a podcast. You can download it on your smartphone or you can listen to it through the internet. And it's very uh, it's very convenient. So you can do it while you're walking or while you're driving. So I would recommend that, but don't just stop at listening to the word of God. Let it truly be a wellspring. Think about what you hear or what you read, and learn from it. Guigo the Carthusian is quoted in the Catechism a couple of times, and he says this. He says, seek in reading, and you will find in meditating. Knock in mental prayer, and it will be open to you in contemplation. So, in other words, stay in the thought. Stay with the text. Return to it throughout the day. Let it be a source of constant nourishment for you. Let it be a wellspring whereby you believe in Christ. So the second wellspring where we drink the Holy Spirit is the liturgy, meaning the Holy Mass and the sacraments, as well as the liturgy of the hours, adoration and benediction, and other liturgical rites. When you participate in the liturgy, and right now I know that's not possible for a lot of people, but when it is possible again, how can we make our time at Mass at a time when we drink the Holy Spirit? One simple way is to make your heart an altar. Place on it first and foremost yourself, your life, and everything that you care about. And then unite your heart, unite your altar to, the, to Jesus who is on the altar in front of you. And then at the offertory especially, Place yourself spiritually on the altar with Jesus. And the mystery of salvation is then open to us in a very powerful way because we're exercising our baptismal priesthood in union with Christ. It's a beautiful way to drink from the wellspring that is Jesus. What about the third wellspring where we drink the Holy Spirit? Here we have the theolog theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. What, what do we do with the theological virtues? What are they there for? They are there so that we can make acts of faith, hope, and charity throughout the day. And we ask for an increase in the theological virtues. Doing this, making these acts, my God, I believe in thee, I hope in thee, I love thee, as simple as that. Making these acts lets these virtues actually shape you. They shape how you think, they shape what you love, and they shape how you act. Finally, the fourth wellspring is today. Yeah, today. This is perhaps the most surprising and I think the most exciting out of these four wellsprings whereby we drink from Christ. Listen to this. This is from the Catechism. His spirit is offered to us at all times in the events of each day to make prayer spring up from us. It is in the present that we encounter God, not yesterday nor tomorrow, but today. Prayer in the events of each day and each moment is one of the secrets of the kingdom. Interesting. It is right and good to pray so that the coming of the kingdom of justice and peace may influence the march of history. 
But this is the catechism. It is just as important to bring the, the help of prayer into humble everyday situations. Everything that I've said so far about drinking the Holy Spirit, about believing in Christ, about the wellsprings where we are able to do that, every part of this happens because of baptism. It is made possible because of baptism. That is when we first receive the Holy Spirit, is baptism, along with the right and the duty to worship God as Catholic Christians. That is when we receive the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity. And we also receive the gifts of the Holy Spirit that help us to use those virtues and cooperate with the work of the Holy Spirit. So if I understand the power of the sacraments, then I can and I will unleash the presence and the grace of the Holy Spirit in my life. I will drink the Holy Spirit from the source, which is faith in Christ. So I know that's a lot so far, but we've got a little bit more to go. So just hang in there with me. We've, got, we've looked at water. Now, what about fire as a symbol of the Holy Spirit? Listen to this. While water signifies birth, and the fruitfulness of life given in the Holy Spirit. Fire symbolizes the transforming energy of the Holy Spirit's actions. Okay, transforming energy. Transform into what? To go back to what I said at the beginning, into the divine life. The, this presence of transforming fire within us is the Holy Spirit making us like Jesus. This is the process of divinization. Again, here's the catechism. Watch out, because this is amazing. As fire transforms into itself everything it touches, so the Holy Spirit transforms into the divine life whatever is subjected to his power. He transforms into the divine life whatever is subjected to his power. This action of the Holy Spirit corresponds to the sacrament of confirmation, which completes the grace of baptism and brings forward into greater and greater maturity this person who is becoming more like Jesus. So the Vatican Council document Lumen Gentium says this, by the sacrament of confirmation, the faithful are more perfectly bound to the church and are endowed with the special strength of the Holy Spirit, that transformative fire. So again, if this language intimidates or uh, scares us a little bit, we can take the opportunity to access and engage the theological virtues of faith, open charity. Ask for deeper faith. The gift of baptism and confirmation and the grace of the Holy Spirit is the greatest thing that God could have done for us, and he did it. So we have received it. It's there. It's in us. Our problem is that we don't think about it and we don't use it. We focus on lower things. We focus on the world around us and all the trappings that are there. And we can look up. We can look up to the eternal call of Christ Jesus, the call to life in him. That call will transform us here and now. It will transform how we live in the world. But the reverse of that is not true. What I mean is my relationship with God, my lived prayer will transform my life and everything in it. But my relationship with the world, if I put that before my relationship with God, will not transform my life of faith. It will destroy it. So we've got to get the priorities straight. What happens is that we worry about now rather than using our today as a wellspring, as a launch pad into faith. We've got it backwards. Instead, what if we, what if we took everything as an opportunity for deeper faith, hope, and love? What if, like children of God, we brought him everything? And talked about things with him like we talk about him, like we talk about them with friends every day. What I'm describing is what Jesus talks about in the Sermon on the Mount. 
He said, do not be anxious about today, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Again, this perspective, this lived faith is made possible by baptism and confirmation and what happens to us in these most powerful sacraments. So let's take some time now to zoom in on the sacraments themselves and talk about these a little bit. So these two sacraments, baptism and confirmation, are part of the triad that make up the sacraments of initiation. The, the third one is the Holy Eucharist. So what happens in this initiation? What does that mean and why, why does it matter? By initiation, we mean the process by which you become a Christian. When you begin to live the life of grace, the grace of baptism is completed and perfected in the sacrament of confirmation. There is a second, you could say, fuller outpouring of the Holy Spirit in confirmation, which, hence the name, confirms and deepens that grace of baptism. Well, what is the grace received at baptism then? Essentially, two things happen at baptism, the forgiveness of sin and the person baptized becomes a new creation in Christ. So for an adult who receives baptism, there's this process by which he or she is taught about the Lord Jesus and also about uh, Christian faith. And they're invited into a process of conversion and a deeper response of faith. The Lord gives the person the grace to both repent and to ask for baptism. Infant baptism, which has been practiced in the church since its earliest days, um, brings with it an obligation on the part of the parents to bring the child up in the faith, such that there's this ongoing process of learning and deepening in the friendship with God through faith and prayer. So every Catholic has the obligation to study the, study the faith, to know it well, and to develop in the life of faith, hope, and charity. That is to say, to develop in this personal and living relationship with God. So whether you're baptized as an adult or as a baby, that is still there, that process of growing in union with God. So let's look more closely at the effects of baptism. First, the forgiveness of sins. This is something that only God can do, as we know. Both the Old and the New Testaments are very clear on that, and it's part of the teaching of Jesus. In baptism, we've, we, receive the, we receive the forgiveness of original sin and any and all personal sin and any punishment due to sin. You might ask, why do we need healing from original sin if it's not something that we ourselves did? So the sin of our first parents had its effect in human nature. Um, you could say that it affected them, but also all their descendants structurally. By human nature, I mean what's common to all of us and what belongs to the makeup of every human person. So you have a body, you have a rational soul, you're free, you're made in the image and likeness of God, you can perform free acts, you can know the truth, and you can make choices about what you love and how you act. All of that belongs to human nature. So our human nature was wounded by original sin. First of all, death entered the world, and now we all suffer the punishment of death. But second, there's also turmoil and tension within the human person. So our intellect or our mind is wounded with ignorance. Our, our will is wounded with malice. Our emotional life tends to take over and dominate our reasoning, thinking selves. Our desire for pleasure is ungoverned. Our self-discipline and our self-control are weakened. I mean, I could go on, but I think we can all relate to this. So all of this is because of original sin. Our relationships are also affected. There is lust and domination that goes both ways between man and woman, where there was once harmony. And creation itself has become hostile to man, as the catechism puts it. So in summary, we've got physical damage, we've got spiritual damage, we've got relationship damage, and we have cosmic damage because of original sin. I mean, that's a lot. So baptism comes in and goes to the source of this gaping wound of sin 
and heals it. First, sin is forgiven. So in those who have been reborn, nothing remains that would impede their entry into the kingdom of God. That's what the catechism says. It's so beautiful. Now, as we all know, this does not mean that our life here on earth is now a piece of cake, as any one of us can attest. There are certain consequences of original sin that we all experience, things that remain like suffering, illness, and death. There's also the fact that human nature remains inclined towards sin, so that each of us has to fight for the crown of victory. We have to forge our character with the help of the Holy Spirit and with the help of grace in the fire of trial and temptation. We have to choose to be free, in other words. And that really can be a battle. One example of this that I love comes from Harper Lee's novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, one of my favorite books. Mrs. DuBose is this grouchy neighbor lady in the book. And uh, Jem and Scout, who are the two children in the book, despise this woman. And he, Jem, eventually gets fed up with her and damages her property. I think he chops down some of her flowers or something. And so as a punishment, he has to read to her for every every afternoon for a month. And what he does not realize is that she is addicted to morphine and she is determined to die free from her addiction. So his reading to her is just a distraction to get her focus off of her craving for drugs. And this battle is something that she has to fight day after day than anything, to die a free woman. And she does. What I love about this example is that the woman, Mrs. DuBose, and she's not a nice woman by any stretch of the imagination, but she has this battle that she undergoes and she, she doesn't overcome her addiction for any other reason, for no person or no thing, except her own self-governance for her own ability to say, I am a free woman. So by the grace of God, each of us can do the same. Now, perhaps there are not such dramatic obstacles in our lives to be overcome. And if so, thanks be to God. But the principle is the same. Do I want to be free? And am I willing to battle? Am I willing to fight for that freedom? The second effect of baptism is the making of a new creature a new creation. And we get that language from St. Paul. Once the soul has been purified of all sin, which is the first effect of baptism, then the grace of God takes up residence, so to speak, and we become temples of the Holy Spirit. Here we can also speak of the grace of justification, which is sanctifying grace. And that has certain effects on us. We receive the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, like I mentioned, And these enable us to believe in God, to hope in him, and to love him. This is one of the wellsprings for drinking the Holy Spirit that I mentioned earlier. We also receive the infused moral virtues, prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, along with the gifts of the Holy Spirit that allow us to respond to his promptings with alacrity. Now, all of that happens in baptism, but we have to unlock, we have to unleash the power of those graces. This is why prayer, thinking about God and talking with him, as well as meditating on the great works of salvation that are presented to us in God's word are so important. These are also those wellsprings that I talked about earlier. Contact with the spirit of God inspires us to act in a way that that corresponds to his presence in our lives. It corresponds to his freely offered gift. So if I'm not praying, it's going to be difficult to respond to the graces of baptism. So what about confirmation? I mentioned that it completes and deepens the graces received in baptism. We receive another special outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and this binds us to the church and gives us that special strength of the Holy Spirit to be true witnesses of Christ. So the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happens at Pentecost is the best way to think about this. Filled with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, the apostles began to proclaim the mighty works of God. And Peter declared that this outpouring of the Holy Spirit was a sign of the messianic age. 
Now, what does that mean? It might be helpful here to step back and look at the preparation for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit that happens in the Old Testament. So we don't often talk about this because we're more focused on the preparation for the Messiah, Christ. However, there was also an expectation of the spirit that was linked to the coming of the Messiah. So the catechism puts it this way, two prophetic lines were to develop, one leading to the expectation of the Messiah, the other pointing to the announcement of a new spirit. So both of these things are happening and they're coming together and converging at the moment of the incarnation. And then Jesus is sending of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. So the prophetic texts that directly concern the sending of the Holy Spirit are oracles by which God speaks to the heart of his people. And according to the promises at the end of time, or the end time, I should say, the Lord's Spirit will renew the hearts of men, engraving a new law on them. And Peter, the morning of Pentecost, identified that morning as the beginning of that time of the Spirit. He saw Pentecost as the fulfillment of those prophetic promises. So again, this outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon all men and women is linked to the coming of the Messiah. It is the Spirit of the Messiah himself. So you can see how all of this then relates to the Trinity. It's amazing. So this means that just as much as the Jews were awaiting the Messiah, they were also awaiting this great manifestation of and giving of the Spirit of God. So the fulfillment of that expectation happens at Pentecost, the moment of Pentecost. And here's the best part. We receive that same grace of the Holy Spirit as the apostles did at our confirmation. Like the apostles, we are more deeply united to God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The gifts of the Holy Spirit increase in us, and we're given a special strength to spread and defend the faith. We have the grace because of our confirmation, to carry out on every occasion any act of virtue. That is awesome. Now, you might be thinking at this point, and I too, when I was reading all this, I was like, wow, I feel like a total loser. I'm a dud. Like nothing is happening, right? What's wrong with me? Why isn't the fact of my confirmation just having this huge impact on my life? And so it's actually a great question. It's a really important question. So what are we doing that's not maybe unleashing this? So what are we doing that might be blocking the Holy Spirit? Okay, so first and foremost, we have to look at our participation in the sacraments, especially in Holy Mass and the sacrament of penance, by which we worship God first and foremost, and he also gives us grace. So this grace that we receive sustains us and strengthens us in this life of cooperation with the Holy Spirit. So I know we're in a pandemic and that complicates things a little bit. Um, So think before the pandemic, before the pandemic, did I go to confession regularly? Meaning at least once a month. And just, you don't have to answer this out loud. Just think to yourself, honestly, Did I go to confession regularly, once a month, at least? If I'm married, did I encourage my spouse or did we go make it a point to go together? As I said, we're inclined towards sin naturally and we need confession to fight against that and and to grow in virtue with the help of God. So confession gives us grace that heals us. Similarly, we can ask ourselves, if I'm a parent, Am I ensuring that my kids have an opportunity to go to confession? Do I take them? If not, why not? Pandemic aside, okay. So this needs to become a normal part of our lives. The same is true for mass and Holy Communion, whereby we participate in Christ's sacrifice to the Father. We participate in his perfect worship of God, and we receive his love for us. So with him at mass, as I mentioned earlier, we can really offer ourselves to God. And that's how we need to approach mass. It's not passive. Go there and lay yourself on the altar with Jesus. Offer your whole life to him and offer it with him in union with him. That's what baptism and confirmation empower us to do. 
Now, I could keep going, but I've said quite a bit already, and it, I know it's a lot to think about. So I'm just going to summarize what we've gone through so far. Two images of fire and water are images of the Holy Spirit that tell us something about him. They also tell us something about his role in the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. Not only does he cleanse and purify us, but we're told by the Lord Jesus to drink the living water that he gives, meaning to drink the Holy Spirit. We do this by believing in Christ and accessing him in the Holy Scriptures, in the liturgy, which means the Mass and the sacraments, and the virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and praying today to God about all the little things that happen in our life. The Holy Spirit is fire because he transforms us through grace to be more and more like Christ, which means bringing out what is best in us and purifying us of everything else. So he has, he has designs on us, you could put it that way, and we can cooperate with that work by our own free choice. The sacraments of baptism and confirmation lay the groundwork for all of this. So if you compare the supernatural life to the natural life, so supernatural life is the life of grace, the to the natural life, which is the, you know, the normal, like how we live every day, baptism could be compared to birth. And so that's one reason that it's called being born again, or it's a, a new generation, a regeneration. And confirmation is like growing up. So maturing in the Christian faith and becoming a true, faithful disciple of Jesus. The Eucharist is the nourishment we need for this growth. So just like you need bodily food to grow up naturally, you need spiritual food to grow spiritually. And that's what the Eucharist does. So in this time when we can't receive Holy Communion, we can make it a practice to pray every day the prayer of spiritual communion so that you're not deprived of the grace that you need. So God is right there. He's ready to help us at every moment. And everything, everything in our lives contributes to this transformation in grace if we have the faith to see it. 